through. Just make sure. It says meeting is now streaming live on custom live streaming service. I'm just going to check while we're, we're uh, getting ready here. And I am going to admit, admit everybody in the waiting room. It says we're live and it's the, I see the menu that you were just messing with. All right, we're online with Facebook. Looks confirmed. All right, everybody. We're just gonna wait a few more minutes for everybody to get on here and then we'll do our intro and get going. All right, I can confirm that we're live on YouTube as well, Karina. We're filling up quickly. <laughs> All right. We've got. About 80 people now. Wow. Our... That's great for. Yeah. See a lot of people complaining about the weather. <laughs> yes. I was hoping for better, but it doesn't seem like uh, my optimism is going to get uh, rewarded this time, but all the same. Oh, can we record? That's a good question. Or we are recording. Recording to the cloud, so um, we should be able to download it directly. Yes, and it'll be available later. And on YouTube. And, and on YouTube. <laughs> so there should be three recordings. And yeah, we're almost ready to begin. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll start with a cool picture, the one of the best I've seen. I'll put it up on my screen while you're doing the introduction. And oh, you need to allow me to do screen sharing. Karina, if you can. Yes, let's figure out how to do that. Which? Um... Yeah, it's true. But I, mean, I want to do it on both because uh, one of them is my iPad. Okay. Yeah. 
make a host? Yeah, make me a co-host. That's how the easiest way to do that. Okay. And then if you can extend that to the iPad, just in case I need to use that. Yes. Great. All good? Yes, we are. Um, so here, I'm just sort of for folks to ponder while we're getting ready to begin, I'll put up this picture that was made in the Philippines by a gentleman named Chris Go, And he's got one of the best pictures I've seen so far. Minimal photo processing. He just brightened up Saturn. So you might see a little box around it, but he didn't actually touch it up in any other way. So that's somebody with a much better telescope than I've ever gotten to use and a really good photo processing uh, situation. So check it out. This is what the clouds are hiding from us. Got morning doves hanging out with me if I care. <laughs> Here's a picture from the Canary Islands by Francisco Rodriguez. And I got to tune in live to a wonderful man named Gianluca Massi from Rome, Italy. He has a robotic telescope in Chicano and he was able to take these pictures, but just to make them look like the other ones, I've reoriented this one so you can see Saturn, upper left, Jupiter, lower right, just to match the other pictures from coming in from around the world. Let me know when you're ready to begin, Karina, and I'll take yeah, this. I'm just admitting our last, I think we're maxing out on the number of participants in our Zoom. So whoever doesn't make it in will hopefully join us on YouTube or Facebook Live. Yeah, head over to the Facebook or YouTube section because it looks like the Zoom room is full. Yeah, we've reached 100. 100. I just That's admitted it. our last one, so. <laughs> We can begin. Um, hold on one second. All right. Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium's live stream of the Great Conjunction. My name is Karina Weiss, and I am the Director of Education. And I would like to introduce our lead science educator, Bobby Farley Rubio, who will be the real star of the show this evening, who is hoping that the weather cooperates and is able to get us a clear image of this once in a lifetime event. I would also like to thank all of you who have sent in your amazing questions, which Bobby will do his best to answer during our broadcast. And now I'll turn it over to Bobby. Oh, thank you so much, Karina. And I'm so grateful for all of you who decided to tune in. Yes, I have a telescope. You can see the dome on the top of Colby Hall at the St. Johnsbury Academy wobbling as I move the deck that I'm standing on moves. But I want to thank the Bongards family for letting us use this wonderful place with a great view of right now, unfortunately, clouds. Uh, our meteorologist, the Eye on the Sky team at the Fairbanks Museum did tell me that there was only a 25% chance that I would have a, a view, but I thought that was good enough to uh, set up the telescope. And if we don't, I have views from all around the world that we can look at to enjoy this amazing, great conjunction. So what this is, to answer the most basic question, is that we're here to see the closest passing of Jupiter and Saturn in our view here from the Earth that we will see for many decades. Great conjunctions are not rare. They happen almost every 20 years, but they are not always this close together. The distance between Jupiter and Saturn right now is around six arc minutes. And we've had to wait 800 years for this to happen. It's almost 800 years since the last time they were this close. And 800 years ago was medieval times. So what people believed was happening might have varied greatly from culture to culture. But today 
we have a better understanding and we actually have robotic spacecraft going around these two planets. So just think of how much has happened on Earth since the last time you could see Jupiter and Saturn this close together. We've now explored outer space with robots. We've sent astronauts to the moon. We've done so many great things. So if you don't get a chance to see this conjunction, the next time they will be this close together won't be until 2080. So this isn't the only conjunction of your lifetime, but this is definitely gonna be the best one of everybody who's listening's lifetime. So if you don't get to see it here, you'll get to see pictures from around the world. And I'm hoping perhaps foolishly that the sky will clear and we will get a chance to see the planets coming out. But either way, we're gonna have fun and I wanna answer as many questions as I can. So I think we might wanna get started with some of those questions. All right. So I think you might have answered parts of some of these already, but um, Charlotte and Jocelyn Mink from Hyde Park, Vermont would like to know when is the best time to see the Great Conjunction and where should we look in the sky? Well, this is the night and looking, if you, wherever you are, looking towards the Southwest right now, anytime between now and about six o'clock, uh, once this, it gets a little dark, it's a little early still. We knew it would be early, but we wanted to get a head start. But if you live in a place and you're watching this and the skies are clear, you're going to want to look southwest. As soon as it gets a little dark, Jupiter will be the brightest light you see. And then if you have sharp eyes and keen vision, you will see Saturn a little bit separated just above it. Uh, but this is a way to test your eyes. If you only see one dot once it gets dark, then you know Maybe it's time to get some uh, finely crafted lenses before your eyes. But most people will be able to see a separation, but it will be so close that it might look like a combined light that's brighter than any planet or any star you've ever seen, besides the sun, of course. Any, I think that's a, well, I hope somebody out there, maybe we'll get somebody in our, in our Zoom chat to, that does have good luck. And if you do have a camera or even more lucky, a telescope, there might be a way for you to share your images with us. Just let us know through the uh, communications through Facebook or YouTube or, uh, or Zoom, and maybe we'll get lucky with someone else's view besides the one from St. Johnsbury here. Let's see, what's the next question, Karina? Sure. Um, Brayden from Morgan, Vermont, and Evelyn from St. Johnsbury also asked the same question. How far apart will Saturn and Jupiter be tonight? Okay, this is a great way to think about this. From our perspective, looking at it two-dimensionally, they will look like they're about six arc minutes apart. And in case you're not familiar with arc minutes, it's like degrees. And then the subdivision of degrees is minutes and seconds. And there's 60 minutes and 60 seconds in each minute. So it's kind of like, it's confusing, but it's a little bit like time. So if you can imagine the six arc minute separation, it's a 10th of a degree, but in reality, they are about 450 million miles apart. Okay, Saturn is the farthest planet that we can see with the naked eye. And uh, Jupiter is the second farthest planet we can see. Roughly, just to put you know uh, rough numbers on it, the distance between us and Saturn is usually around a billion miles. And to Jupiter, about half that, about 500 million miles. So just to give you some rough numbers, even though we are calling it a conjunction, by no means are they conjoined like twins. They're actually quite distant, but it's just something that is based on our perspective on the Earth, the platform that we live on moving around, and these two much slower moving planets. So in case you don't already know, Jupiter takes 12 years to go around the sun, and Saturn takes nearly 30 years. So of all the planets involved in this great conjunction, we are the fastest moving one. We go around the sun once a year. So we're basically zipping around the racetrack and we have these two slow moving planets in the distance. And because they have decades long orbits around the sun, it takes roughly every 20 years for their orbits to line up in a way that it looks that way for us. So it's all about mathematics and timing, but the fact that astronomers can predict this event centuries in advance is kind of one of the coolest things about astronomy. Once mathematicians and astronomers figured out the clockwork of the universe, these kinds of events can become predictable. So it's, it's a sort of a sign of, of where we are in science that we knew that this was gonna happen for centuries before it did. So any more questions, Karina? 
I can't hear you right now, Karina. You're muted. Oh. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, the next question comes from Dean from Melbourne, Australia, all the way out there. And he wants to know, does your owl mascot have a name? I think he's referring to our series of videos that we've been making. Oh, yes. That like the owl on my hat here. Yes. The, the Fairbanks night owl. I will be honest, it does not have an official name, nor does, nor gender. It could be a she. Maybe we should have a contest. And uh, I haven't decided what to call the owl. So this may be a really cool way to get folks out there to participate. You could start now, but maybe we'll do some kind of event in the future where we'll let uh, kids write a good explanation for why the, the owl should be named what we choose. So uh, there is no name, but thanks for writing in all the way from Australia. That sounds awesome. Yeah, he had he said he had visited three years ago and loved it here. So he's hopefully tuning in right now from Australia. Where it's about 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's sleeping. I'm not sure. All right. Um, the next question comes from Atticus from West Glover, and he wants to know when this happened about 800 years ago, did people know the science that we know now, or did they think it was something else? And how did they react? Um, his follow-up question is, if it is every 800 years, um, what about 1600 years ago and back more and more and more? Um, basically, he wants to know, has the way people understood it changed? And is this maybe what people thought was the manger star? Ah, well, that's a huge number of questions all packed in. Sorry to throw it all at you, Bobby. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad because this is something I'm happy to uh, address. In fact, what people believed very much depends on what time in history we're talking about and which continent or culture they lived in. Because 800 years ago, if you lived in the Middle East, like in Baghdad, there was a lot of astronomical learning going on. Many of the stars that names that we use today in astronomy come from this period, a golden age of science happening in the Arabic world. And that's why we have stars with names like Betelgeuse. Uh, you know, and Dubi and Mirak in the sky. These are all Arabic names. So Arab scholars would have known these planets because they were inheritors of knowledge that goes back to the ancient Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans. But unfortunately, not everywhere was this knowledge widely spread because even in Europe, where the Greeks and the Romans once lived, around 800 years ago, Europe was going through what we think of as the Middle Ages or even the Dark Ages. And there was a lot less education attained by the average person during this time. I just want to refer people to Monty Python's uh, Holy Grail movie, Bring Out Your Dead. So people who lived in that situation probably did not know much about the astronomical lore that even their own ancestors might have had in their knowledge centuries before. And a lot of that has to do with something that uh, Carl Sagan brought up when he made the original Cosmos series with his wife, Andruian. He talked about the burning of the Library of Alexandria. So here I have a famous painting of one of the greatest tragedies in history. Alexandria, Egypt, had the world's biggest and considered the first library. And all of the knowledge in mathematics and science and astronomy that was known by the Egyptians and by the Arabic world and the Persian world and the world of the Greeks and the Romans, it was all stored in this one place. But because it was on the coast of Egypt, every time an invading army came in to try to sack the city of Alexandria, the library took a hit and it eventually got burned down and all the knowledge there was lost. So much of the knowledge was carried to other parts of the world by scribes that translated into Arabic and into Persian and other languages. But the stuff, the, a lot of folks in Europe lost connection. It's like they lost their Wi-Fi. They lost their connection with the ancient past. And that's how you got to the dark ages and medieval times when people in Europe didn't even know how to build the buildings that the ancient Romans before had built. So that's why I say what people thought in the past really depends on where you lived. But people in ancient times understood the planets, not the way we do. But if you lived in the time of the ancient Greeks, the word planet comes from the Greek language. And 2000 years ago, the ancient Greeks did not have telescopes. They did not know that these worlds were anything like our own, but they use the word planet because the word planet comes from a Greek word that means the same thing as hobo, vagabond, traveler. So 
they saw these as lights that wandered in the sky, independent of the stars. They could move from one constellation to another, like a traveling star. And the Greeks named them after their gods and goddesses. In fact, Jupiter was originally known as Zeus to the ancient Greeks. And Saturn, that's a Roman name, was originally known to the Greeks as Kronos. So maybe we'll have some time later for a little storytelling. But I hope that answers some of the questions. What people understood about the planets varies greatly throughout time. But almost every culture, even in prehistoric times, they noticed that these planets were different from the ordinary stars just because of the fact that they move from one constellation to another. What's the next question? So can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Um, so Gary in Colchester, who wants to mention that he watches you every month on WCAX, is asking, why has it taken 397 years since the last conjunction, but only 80 years until the next one? And when is the one after 2080? And I think this was a similar question as Rebecca Williams from Woodstock, Vermont. I just want to give everybody a shout out. Oh, well, this it gives me an excuse to do one of my favorite things, which is to talk about the rhythmic dance of the planets. So the planets go around the sun and they all have their separate timings, but it's not a perfect system. They're not all dancing on the same dance floor. Some of them are on slightly different planes than others. So as we all go around the sun, whether or not we get to see a conjunction is dependent on whether they line up just right. The easiest way to think of it is the conjunctions that are more common, like eclipses, when the moon and the sun line up. If the sun and the moon and the earth were perfectly lined up, there would be a lunar eclipse every time that there is a full moon, and there would be a solar eclipse every time that there's a new moon. And I guess that would be awesome, but also maybe those events would be boring because it would be too regular. But the reason why these things don't happen with any kind of perfect orderly spacing is because of the fact of this dance and i'm going to show you folks a way that you can do this at home with a free piece of software called stellarium in fact i'm just going to type in the website for stellarium in our chat function so that folks can find it and maybe as soon as this is over they can try to follow along um, stellarium is a free program and it's very similar to what we use in our planetarium and here unfortunately it's going to show us what we're missing <laughs> tonight but I'm gonna do more things with it than we could do in the real sky. So here I have it showing us a summer scene, but this is very accurate as far as what's in the sky. So if you see, I just advanced time to a little bit, about 20 minutes from now, and that's when we would be able to see Jupiter easily if the sky was clear. And if we zoomed in with our virtual telescope here, we would see Saturn and Jupiter together. Now, this is the view I was hoping to show you folks with the telescope, but all the same, this is actually happening behind the clouds. And uh, I can show you pictures from around the world of people who do have better weather today, who've proven this is happening right now. However, let's dive deeper into this. Let's turn off the atmosphere and the cardinal directions and the ground and let's go out into space and free ourselves from being on the earth with day and night cycles so we can see what's really going on. And if I fast forward time greatly, you're gonna see a lot of things moving around. You're gonna see the moons of Jupiter dancing around their planet. You're gonna see Saturn in the distance, but they're moving and we're moving on the earth. And so you can see that the alignments don't necessarily work out in a perfect way, but if I zoom out even farther and I put this into context with the sun, this all will make a lot more sense. So I hope everybody's able to see this. I'm going to fast forward time and now you're going to see the calendar. I know it's a little choppy with the internet, so uh, I hope you just follow along. But what are those other wandering lights? Oh, besides Saturn and Jupiter, we've got other planets in the sky. Oh, and that bobbing right in front of us is the moon going by once a moon every 20 and a, 29 and a half days. So if I fast forward a little bit more, you might get to see the planets dancing around the sun. I know the video is a little choppy. Maybe you want to try this at home. And then those of you who are familiar with the constellations will realize that the sun and the planets and the moon are always dancing through the same 12 constellations that we know, like Leo. And that's not Taylor Swift, that's Virgo. 
And then here comes Libra. And then the scorpion, Scorpius. So I know it's a little choppy, but imagine how many years you'd have to wait to get all of these observations in. And you can see that the planets are going around the sun, but not in a perfect line, dancing around. Uh, I hope that this gets through with our internet speed here. But all the same, those of you who are thinking astrologically, no, I am not a fortune teller. The Fairbanks Museum, we only do astronomy, the science of the stars. We do not talk about predicting your fortune based on where the planets are on your birthday. But just so you know, the dates that astrologers use are about 2,200 years out of date. And unless you were born around 200 BC, you might be reading the wrong section of the horoscope your whole life. But that, just so you know, I gave, I, that's a crash course in what took humans thousands of years to figure out, that the sun seems to be going through these stars and the planets seem to be dancing around them. But actually, it took people like Galileo with his telescope in 1609 to finally confirm that, hey, we're one of those things too. We're not just sitting in the middle watching this dance around us. We are part of the dance. We are one of the participants on that solar system electric slide as we go around the sun. So that is the great story of the history of astronomy. And most of that knowledge took thousands of years to accumulate. But in reality, since the telescope, it's only been 400 years since we've really known what's going on up there. So I hope I, I hope that visual went well, but I have uh, other videos, that, uh, other visuals that might go smoother than that. So let me know if there's any more questions, Karina. Oh, uh, you got to unmute yourself again. Yep, got to get used to that. Um, so let me pull up our questions. All right, the next question is from Evan and Adam in. Uh, Montpelier, Vermont, and they would like to know where in the world is the best place to watch the Great Conjunction? Where on earth? Ah, well, this is, is actually an event that could be seen from anywhere in the world. Um, the only place I could think of that you might not be able to see it well is uh, in the Antarctic where they're entering a period of six months of daylight right now. But if, uh, so if you're on McMurdo Station or South Pole Station, you probably couldn't see anything. But everybody else in the world could see this, which is one of the wonderful things about it. And I do see something that came up in the chat about the solstice. Today is the winter solstice. No, that is not tied to the conjunction other than a great coincidence. The last one happened in the year 2000 in the month of May. So what month it happens in is not necessarily certain, but it is a day uh, that is very important in astronomy too. This is the date that is the shortest day and the longest night of the year. And this is something that humans have known about also for thousands of years. In fact, you could argue that the winter solstice and the solstices in general are kind of what led humans to understand the calendar of the sky. Um, I should mention something very funny that was in the news today because of unfortunately COVID-19, the annual celebration of the solstice at Stonehenge was banned this year. And the headline at the BBC today was Stonehenge winter solstice ban criticized by senior Druid. Yes, there are still people who get there every winter solstice to see the sunrise between the sarsen stones. And that is thought to be why they built that place. And I can show you another place in the world that is famous for its alignment with the winter solstice. This happens to be in Ireland. And even though it's not nearly as famous as Stonehenge, it's actually much older. In fact, according to the folks there in Ireland, this building called Newgrange is older than the Great Pyramids of Egypt. And what did they build it for? just to see the winter solstice. So let me show you a picture. And I gotta give a shout out to Mark Breen. He is actually the only person I know who's actually visited this place called Newgrange. But if anybody ever wants to go to see someplace in Ireland that's pretty cool, this is a 5,000 year old building with a very narrow opening. And only on the days around the winter solstice does the sunlight reach into this building and shoot about 18 meters down the hallway onto a back wall. So that is how important the winter solstice is that people around the world were willing to dedicate entire buildings just to knowing what day of the year they were in. Um, and this is not the only places, lots of places around the world have been found to serve this function, but Stonehenge, Newgrange, the pyramids, 
uh, the Gobleki Tepe in Turkey, the Miami Circle in Florida that was found recently. These are all just examples of uh, astronomy observatories based on watching the sunrises and sunsets that would let you know when the solstice was. So it's a big day for a lot of reasons today. It's the first day of winter. It's also the shortest day, longest night of the year. So let's see any more questions coming in, Karina. All right, let's see. The next set of questions come from the Riverside Schools fifth graders. Uh, the first question they have is, oh, sorry, just had to admit someone, I popped over to Zoom. Um, why do they look like they are so close? Well, it's just a matter of alignment, just like how my fingers in the camera <laughs> might look like they're touching, but actually they're quite a bit uh, distance away. So that's all the conjunction is. Conjunction, uh, think of conjoined, like, uh, well, uh, less, less fortunate, like conjoined twins. That's the other way we use that word. So it's just a visual thing. If those two planets did touch each other, that would be big news. We would see an explosion that would light up the sky, even in the daytime. But that's not expected to happen. Don't worry. That's not part of the, the plan. <laughs> Awesome. And sorry, that was from Kellett. I didn't recommend, uh, I didn't say his name. Um, the next question is from Gabe and he wants to know how did the planets get so big in the first place and how long did it take them to get that big and how do they shine so bright? Well, I'll, ask, I'll answer the last one first. The shining is just reflections of sunlight. So the same reason why our daytime looks so bright is the reason why these planets look bright to us. We're seeing their daytime sides. And because of how they go around the sun, we can't actually see their nighttime sides uh, ever unless we use a spaceship. And that gives me a great excuse to show you one of the best pictures ever taken of planet Saturn. It was taken by Cassini, the robotic spacecraft that was orbiting around Saturn for nearly a decade. So let me start with a picture that is what you would see if you were looking at Saturn heading that way from our direction. This is a picture that Cassini saw on its way there, but that's close to the view you get from the Earth, except that it's, you know, you see where the sun is coming from, you see where the shadow is. But now let me show you what Cassini saw when it flew on the opposite side of Saturn. Now, this is an eclipse of the sun with Saturn. The rings of Saturn, the sunlight is going through them. You see the nighttime side of Saturn, but you can see so much light from the rings that it doesn't even look totally dark on the nighttime side. And those rings are made out of ice crystals. I actually have some close-up pictures. So these planets, Saturn, this is a great way to talk about it, and Jupiter, they're both mostly made out of hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is the most abundant thing in the universe. 75% of the universe is that H. Hydrogen, that is the H in our H2O, water. So when you have big formed uh, things in space, nebulas, planets that are huge, gas giants, we call them, the sun, all of the stars, they're mostly made out of hydrogen. That's the most abundant thing. But we are not mostly made out of hydrogen. Our planet is made out of other materials. So we are made out of stuff that is a lot less abundant. That's why the rocky planets are all very small compared to the gas giants. So if you're wondering, hmm, the sun and Saturn and Jupiter, they're all made out of hydrogen. Could Saturn and Jupiter have become stars? And technically the answer is yes, but not without a lot more gas. So Jupiter, the biggest of the planets in the solar system is not big enough to be a star, but we have seen stars in our galaxy that are the size of Jupiter. So the difference is density. You'd need to have a lot more gas. If you were able to do that, uh, let's see, I think I have some nice pictures of this. So there is a star called Trappist-1 that has its own planets going around it. And the sun for these planets is the size of Jupiter. So if Jupiter had managed to convince the sun that we have, to donate some more gas, like so that Jupiter wasn't where it is now, but had 30 times more density, then it could have become a star. And that would mean that we Earthlings would have two suns. 
like Luke Skywalker did on Tatooine. It's not impossible. We've seen it happen a lot in the cosmos. So here's a picture that shows you the sizes of the planets in our solar system relative to the sun. So if you look on the left hand side, you see the big red circle, that's the size of the sun. Do you see the little blue dot about two thirds of the way up in the middle? That's earth and the moon, that little dot to the left. Jupiter and Saturn are right in the middle, huge, but still small compared to the sun. And then if you look way up at the top of this picture, you see a small thing that says 1A star, Trappist-1 system. That small red circle is the size of the sun that the Trappist-1 planets go around. And these planets are all similar to the size of the Earth. But it just lets your imagination run wild. Jupiter could have been a star. Maybe if Saturn and Jupiter had combined their gas instead of being separate planets and the sun had allowed itself to be a little smaller, we would have a totally different star system and a totally do different messed up calendar. Can you imagine trying to figure out what time it is or day it is if you have two suns in the sky? So things could have worked out very differently. And this is a cool thing to think about with the Trappist system, by the way, not to get too far afield, but look at the sizes of these planets that were discovered by a team at the University of Belgium. That's why they named it Trappist after the famous monks that make jams and uh, adult beverages. But the Trappist one system, all is all Earth-like planets, and they all have orbits of something between one and a half days to 20 days. So this is just to show you how different a solar system could be from our own. So I hope that didn't go too far afield, but I want you to realize that when we think about giant planets like Saturn and Jupiter, they're not totally unlike things like stars. There are tiny stars, red stars and red dwarfs and brown dwarf stars that are around the same size as Jupiter. So we have giant planets, but remember Jupiter itself has moons, dozens of moons. Those are the ones that were discovered by Galileo plus dozens more. And it's almost like Jupiter is a, a miniature solar system with its own worlds going around it. So let's move on to some more questions. I'm gonna turn on a light out here. It's looking like the light is failing me and so is the sky. I don't see any chance of a, improved views but maybe we'll see when they switch the light on at colby hall that'll be kind of cool what's the next question karina all right uh Satoda asks uh how are they moving close together and quinn wants to know will they ever actually hit each other okay i did answer the hitting part and let's be glad to say no <laughs> there's nothing that we have that says that they will ever collide with each other um, and remember, Satoda, that is just the illusion that they're close together from the fact that we are seeing them lined up, but they're not really any closer together than they often are. And that's totally an Earth based perspective. If you were on a different planet, there would be no great conjunction tonight. Like Mars wouldn't be celebrating this if they were people there to celebrate it. Awesome. And Ignacio wants to know, have all the other planets ever lined up? Now, all of the planets are always close to lining up with that, that line I showed earlier uh, on Stellarium where you can see the zodiac, the ecliptic line. Oh, thank you. They turned the light on out here. This is, that's nice. So the, so the planets in some crude way are always lined up, but it's not that rare for you to be able to see all five of them at the same time. I mean, tonight, if it was clear, you would also see Mars directly overhead at the same time as we're watching this great conjunction. And if you got up early in the morning, you'd see Venus. And there are often times when Mercury is visible too, although that is the hardest planet to see because it's the fastest of the planets as far as moving around. It's named after the messenger of the gods for good reason. But seeing them all together, I've been working at the Fairbanks Museum for uh, about 17 years now. And I can remember two occasions in which all five were visible together at the same time. So it's not that rare. It's something you can hope to see. And once we are back in business at the Fairbanks Museum, I would love to be able to show folks how to make that happen in the sky. Well, hold on, before we get on to any questions, I thought maybe this would be a good chance for me to bring up something else, folks, about supporting the Fairbanks Museum. You see, the Fairbanks Museum, like all the businesses around here, have been you know, having a tough time with what's going on, but one way that you can help us with all of this is by getting a membership. And if you 
get your membership now during this presentation, you get a $25 discount. Uh, you go to our fairbanksmuseum.org website and you can donate and get the special great conjunction offer. And when you get a membership to the Fairbanks Museum, not only do you support programs like this and our educational team going around to schools and uh, all, all the stuff we do, like the eye on the sky weather on the radio, not only do you support that, but you also get for yourself uh, a pass that allows you to get into museums all around the country for free or at a greatly discounted rate. So I know some of you folks may be thinking, I still don't have a gift for that person on my list. You can buy a gift certificate or a family membership for your friends and you could come into the visit the Fairbanks Museum. They'll be open until uh, Christmas Eve. So this is a great way for you to support our museum and to get those Christmas gifts crossed off of your list. So please, uh, you know, take advantage of this $25 off offer because you can buy a gift to your family and then you can buy a, a gift for someone else who would great, greatly benefit from a membership like this. And membership it includes discounts to the store, free admission to our museum and free planetarium shows, but also it's worth it just if you travel to places like Massachusetts or California and you try to go to their museums, the discount will will give you is more than worth the cost of our membership. So please consider that. And now that I've done that, let's get back to questions about the Great Conjunction. Awesome, thanks, Bobby. Um, Rosa from the Riverside School would like to know, why does Saturn have rings? Ooh, great question. And I have some really good pictures to show you about this. So the rings of Saturn are kind of a mystery because there are faint rings around Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune too. So we think of rings as being sort of like the path of debris that could be orbiting a planet. The moon is orbiting the earth and you could say humans have created a ring of stuff around the earth of satellites, artificial satellites. But Saturn's rings are definitely the standout of all the planets in the solar system. And let me show you some of the cool insights we got from the Cassini mission uh, not long ago, this mission ended, but while it was there, it got some of the greatest pictures of Saturn's rings. Let me switch to that for a second here. This was one of NASA's greatest robotic missions. And here's a picture of Saturn with the rings. And I hope you recognize what's in the background because that's you and everybody you know in that little blue dot that we call Earth. So that gives you an idea. If you were at Saturn looking back this way, that's what you'd see. But those rings in that picture they're mostly made out of ice. And not only did you see this image a, mo a moment ago of the sun shining through them, but Cassini actually flew through the rings twice and it captured some really cool close-up photos. So give me, let me give, me give me a second here and I'm gonna show you what Cassini saw that actually helped us understand how the rings actually form. So let's, maybe here, here's some new pictures that I've added here. So here's a close up of the fact that in the rings of Saturn, you've actually got some moons, Atlas, Epimetheus, Pandora, Daphnis, Pan. And you can actually see that they're kind of like little Roombas, little vacuum cleaners. They're cleaning up the ice that's in their channel. So you see these dark lanes in the rings where there's no ice. And if you look at the left of this picture, you can actually see the shadow of the rings. So the rings are very thin and wispy, made out of ice, but they're thick enough that they can cast a shadow. Um, well, if when Cassini was much closer to the rings, it took some of these photographs. Now check this out. This is one of the rings, the B ring. And what you see at the middle of this picture are towers of what might be like foggy cloud ice structures that are miles tall. So the shadows that you see in this picture are about a mile, the longest ones are about a mile long. These are towers of material puffing up in the rings of Saturn. This is stuff that we could never have seen without the spaceship being there. And it gives us an insight as to what is going on in these rings. Are these rings new? Are they being generated by something that just recently happened? Maybe in the last 400 years. So we think they've always been there, but maybe when Galileo uses a telescope in 1609, there was no rings in 1607, but they formed in 1608 and we thought they were always been there. I doubt it, but that is also within the realm of possibility. But we also see inside the rings things that look like the formation of new bodies, like maybe moons forming. 
So these little features that you see photographed inside the rings are like knots in the rings where there's a clump of material that's thicker than the rest and it's drawing in the stuff around it. And because of the way gravity works and because of the fact that these particles are all moving at an orbit, they're all going thousands of miles an hour, you start to get these nice twisting effects. It looks very beautiful. And some of them got nicknamed propellers. So here is a picture of the rings where we're looking at it near the edge of the disc, near the edge of the plane. And you can see there's something in the ring that's thicker than the rings. And it seems to be dragging the material that it's going through. The stuff above it is being pulled by its gravity and the stuff below it is being dragged. So it's kind of distorting the ring. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the rings of Saturn. And one of the biggest surprises of the Cassini mission is that we actually saw that there was one thing forming a ring. And I'm gonna show you a picture here of one of my favorite places in the solar system, a place called Enceladus. It's a moon of Saturn's, a moon the size of the state of Iowa, which means it's pretty small compared to the things we're talking about. But it's a moon that's leaking water every day. And when we got there with Cassini, we saw that it was actually spraying water, making a ring that we call the E-ring. And oops, I'm sorry, that's, a, that's one of Jupiter's moons. We'll go back there. But here is a map of the ring system with some of the moons. And you can see Enceladus right there close to the middle of the picture is actually generating some of the material that makes the rings. And Enceladus, well, here it is leaking into space. Do you see the bottom of this picture? It's got geysers that shoot water by the millions of gallons a day. And we think the water is coming out of an ocean, subsurface ocean under the ice that might be as deep as part of our ocean is. So I know some of the kids are watching this wondering if there's something swimming under that ice. We do not know, but you should start training to become an astronaut scuba diver if you're listening to this now, if you're a kid, because maybe this will be where you go to explore. So one more thing I wanted to show you about Enceladus though, because Saturn, one of its moons tells us that the ingredients for life or already out there in space. When Cassini flew behind Enceladus and saw the water spraying out of this moon, they analyzed the spectrum of the water and they saw that most of it is water vapor, but it also includes things that we know well on earth like methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and the things called simple organics and complex organics include molecules like amino acids, the building blocks of all the life on earth. So I'm not trying to tell you there's life up there, but what I can say is that we know that the ingredients for life and water too are not just on the earth, but included in places like the moons of Saturn and Jupiter. Because I did show you this picture a moment ago, but Jupiter's moon Europa is very similar to Enceladus. So all of the things included in this great conjunction include the rings of Saturn, moons that contain oceans and possibly the ingredients and possibly even life itself. We don't know yet, but this is a great time to start studying this subject because we are continuing to discover. But uh, let's see if we got any more questions coming in. We're running oh, low on time. I want to show so many more things. I wish <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show while you ask that question, I'm going to put up a picture of what other folks have already seen of this uh, great conjunction. Let's see if. Uh, sure. Yeah. So Celia uh, wants to know uh, if the last time this happened, the Great Conjunction, was something bad happening in that time, like the pandemic today? Well, now, it depends on who you ask, because if we're talking about the one 800 years ago, uh, depends if you think the Crusades are a good thing or a bad thing, or depending on what end of the spear you were on, I guess. But uh, I don't think that we could say that this has any coincidence with any particular bad thing. I mean, this pandemic, this year, 2020, no one will deny that it's a terrible year. But there's a lot of people out there who claim to be psychics and fortune tellers and ask them, did any of them make any predictions in 2019 about how bad 2020 was going to be? So the planets don't know and nobody on Earth knows the future either. But it's maybe look at it this way. This is one of the nice things about this year that lets us look up and think and wonder and maybe worry a little less about what's going on on this one planet here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead if there's any more questions. I yeah. think I've um, I'm, I'm a picture I wanted to show, but yes. So Lindsay Hardy wants to know how long will the conjunction be visible? 
Ah, well, the good news is that these planets are going to be visible for many more weeks to come. They just won't be this close together. So I've got a picture up here taken by a guy named Chris Go in Cebu City in the Philippines, one of the earliest pictures I've seen. And we've got some other pictures I showed earlier from the Canary Islands. Francisco Rodriguez made this picture of Saturn and Jupiter together. So if you went out tomorrow night, they would still be visible, but not close enough that you could fit them into a single frame. And here's a, a gentleman from Italy who actually runs a telescope. The virtual telescope EU is a website where you could have watched Italy's view live. And I was able to do that. That was around lunchtime for us. So uh, I have this as a backup plan because unfortunately we did not get the views that the Italians today were able to get. But thanks to Gianluca Massi and his website, I was able to see these pictures while it was happening from the same country where the first telescope to see these planets was used. And actually, if you look at this picture, you can see why Galileo thought that Saturn didn't have rings. He actually thought it looked like it had ears. And that was his description. So think of the handles on a sippy cup, kids. If you don't have the most powerful telescope or perfect views, the rings of Saturn don't look like rings. They look like ears. So those are some views of the Great Conjunction. I wish that I could add to these pictures myself, but unfortunately, uh, the clouds have only gotten thicker since I've been sitting out here. So let's see if there's any more questions. Yeah, Bobby, I just wanted to mention, um, can you let us know where did we get this awesome telescope? Ah, uh, I do want to give a special shout out to uh, Dave and Cindy Poplowski. I don't know if the telescope is visible anymore, but I'm going to try to shine some light on it here. So you can see this is a very large 10 inch telescope that was kept in nearly pristine condition since 1985 when it was purchased. And the Poplowskis are friends of the museum that saw me on channel three and they wanted to give this telescope to a place where it would get some use. And I'm so grateful that they thought of the Fairbanks Museum because it's set up here and I wish I could show a picture from it, but I did test this out weeks ago and Karina can attest that the view was amazing. It just wasn't during the Great Conjunction. So uh, hopefully in the future, once the pandemic is over and we can have a star parties with group, large groups of people, everyone will get a chance to view uh, something through the Popolowski telescope here. Yes, I believe those pictures were posted on Facebook and we can repost them at some point this evening or tomorrow for those of you who wanna see that uh, because it was pretty spectacular. All right, so we have another question. Um, will Titan be visible during the Great Conjunction? And that comes from Braden from Morgan, Vermont. All right, well, great question from Braden there. And I'm gonna show you that, yes, in fact, one of the pictures here, uh, let me see. Ooh, actually, it was at, during uh, Mr. Uh, Masi's presentation earlier. I'm gonna put a uh, live, this was not live, but this was live from Italy earlier today. He was processing the pictures that he was taking, and I'm going to just jump through his live stream because at one point, ah, oh, there it is. All right. So if you're watching one, oh gosh, so silly me. I got to start over again. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Right near the end, he was processing his images, and there, if you look carefully, you'll see. It looks overblown, right? Overexposed. Jupiter looks too bright, but you see the moons that Galileo saw. And actually, because of it's overexposed and a little blurry, this is very similar to what it looked like for Galileo in 1609 with his telescope. And Jupiter is the bright one. The dimmer one above is Saturn. And if you look very carefully to the right and above Saturn, that little dot is the moon called Titan. And Titan is the biggest moon of all the moons in the solar system and it is the only moon that has its own atmosphere so we were talking about places that have water like europa around jupiter and enceladus around saturn but titan has actually had its own spacecraft visit by the the cassini mission brought a probe called huggins and huggins is named after christian huggins who was a dutch astronomer who was the first person to have a telescope good enough to see that moon Titan and he detected it. And now we see it all the time, but let me give you a much better picture of what Titan looks like thanks to the Cassini mission. So yes, the, to answer Braden's question most directly, yes, Titan is usually visible when Saturn is visible. If you have a good enough telescope, 
but let's see. I, I've got to show you this because um, Titan is was so exciting what we saw there that already NASA is planning on sending a drone mission back to Titan. So let's just take a moment to look at this amazing place. A moon with air. A moon that Cassini revealed has large bodies of liquid, not water. Don't get too excited because Titan is 300 below zero. And let me just show you one of the pictures of the Huggins probe. It was a parachute probe coming down slowly over about an hour and a half as it fell through the sky and it rotated and took photographs on the way down. And can you imagine the surprise when scientists at NASA saw that there were rivers and deltas and branching forking streams on the surface of Titan? Nobody expected that, but it's 300 below zero, so it's not water. But when we got to the ground, we saw, this is a color image of the ground on Titan. Water is those boulders in front of the camera frozen because at 300 below zero, water is always going to be solid. So if you're wondering what could have made the liquid in the rivers of Titan, well, we now know there's entire oceans of it. That's what we saw from outer space. These dark lakes and seas of Titan are filled with methane, which is on Earth a gas, a gas that we can pass if we eat lots of beans for supper. So when I tell kids about Titan, the most memorable way to teach them about this is that there is a place in the solar system where it actually rains farts, at least the methane. And the methane pools evaporate and cause clouds to form. And then it rains back down onto the ground again. And if that's not bad enough, well, we're about to send a drone there. In fact, down at Johns Hopkins University, which has become famous because of their amazing tracking of the coronavirus, well, um, they also have the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And there, those folks, uh, they have the plans for a robotic drone that's gonna fly through that atmosphere of Titan. And it's a helicopter, quadcopter drone. But the funny thing about it is that it has very tiny propellers because um, that air on Titan is actually about 50% thicker than the air here. So you could get away with smaller propellers and uh, a smaller spacecraft and see if I can find a video of this uh, uh, just to show you. But uh, look up the Titan drone at, uh, uh, in, on NASA's website and you will see what's just in the works now. But it's a helicopter-like probe that is planned for Titan. That's how exciting Titan is for NASA scientists that they're sp sending a special robot just for that moon. And we also have a special robot going just to Europa called the Europa Clipper that's going to have a special little robotic probe called Bruy on board. And this is a drone that's meant to go underwater. So I actually have some pictures of that. So this is just a little bit of a hint as to what's in the future. 2080, 60 years from now. Uh, when that day comes, what will we be talking about during that great conjunction? I may not be with you folks in that time. I don't know. But maybe we'll be talking about what this thing found under the ice of Europa. This is a little robot called Bruy that's being tested in Antarctica. And this device will be one day sent to that moon of Jupiter's called Europa. And what if when it turns on its cameras and probes and lights, it dis discovers tentacles swimming around? No, just kidding, of course. But there could be anything there. So this great conjunction, if you're watching this, just the fact that you're here trying to participate means that you care about the sky. And just think of how many people that puts you in connection with throughout history, the stars, the planets. Those are some of the things that our ancient ancestors from all different times knew. We see them, they see them. Very little has uh, stayed the same on the ground, but the sky still looks very similar to us as it did for our ancestors. And so when you think about the planets, think about the ancient ones, wondering what they meant and maybe thinking they could use them to predict the future. And then think about the planets as the fact that the future means that in some of us, maybe our kids will be exploring and living on those moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So the future and the past of humanity can be perfectly uh, studied and, and enjoyed when you're looking at the planets during something like this great conjunction. But, oh, the sky never participated. But I will say that I, 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 I could show you, it's a beautiful view of St. Johnsbury. I don't know if you can see it, but the, it, it kind of looks like a metropolis from here. 
from this distance up here on Rocky Ridge Road. So I want to thank you all for attending this. I don't know if we have any more questions coming in because it's almost five o'clock. Yeah, and Bobby, I was going to mention it's it's close to five, but um, I'm happy to keep going because we, we do have some other questions. But for those uh, questions that we do not get to, um, you are... Feel free to email me at kweiss at fairbanksmuseum.org. My email address is also on our website, so you can find it there. Um, and we are happy to send you an answer to the questions we didn't get to. Um, but we can keep going, Bobby, if you're up for it. Um, Absolutely. And we were also wondering, um, perhaps we should um, show the telescope view so that we can see what building you have in, in that view. Yes, as I stand up, I'm making the whole place wobble. Yep. <laughs> Let's see if I can uh, get a, something with some lights on. While you're, while you're doing that. Um, That's the tower at the top of Colby oh. Hall at the St. John's Beer Academy. Nice. And I'm way on the other side of town, by the way, if you want to know. This telescope is set up with an 88 times magnification lens right now. So that, I mean, if there was a person standing in that tower, we'd be able to see their face and see if they're waving at us. And that's uh, well over a mile away from here. Uh, from here, I can barely make out the building at all. It's like that big. So it's pretty cool what telescopes can do. But if you think things look a little weird, that's because... Most telescopes, like the Schmidt Cassegrain that I'm using, they have curved mirrors and lenses that end up flipping the picture upside down and usually left to right opposite of what it normally would be. In astronomy, that doesn't really matter, especially nowadays when you can just take the picture of Photoshop and flip it around. But this allows for better use of lenses than if you were trying to get it to look right side up and left and right true, you would have to use more mirrors and more lenses that would degrade the quality of the picture this way you get the highest quality. And I gotta say this, this telescope from the Poplowskis is as good a telescope I've, as I've ever gotten to use. So I wish the sky cooperated. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who are on Zoom and on our speaker view, you might have to click on telescope view in order to see that. Yeah, that I, I, I can't pin the video for everyone, but a telescope view, uh, maybe what I can make it easier is by muting this computer Well, I just pinned it, so hopefully people can see it. It's shaky because uh, Bobby's moving around on my parents' deck, and that's where the telescope is. Um, I will, I'll try to do that, yeah. Let's see. All right. All right. There we go. I hope the I, I, let's see if I can see get, rid get rid of the feedback. feedback. But now my voice should be making the telescope view, uh, the primary view, in case you haven't figured out how to pin it. But yes, you can even see the mechanism for the bell tower in there. Uh, that's how good my view is. And this is with low light. So with a brighter light, you would see even sharper view. Anybody cool. see any aliens hiding in that little tower? <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, the next question comes from Germany. Wow. Um, from Micah Kern. And they would like to know, do the planets ever appear closer and bigger like the moon does during a supermoon occurrence? Now, um, let's see, can you hear me? Yep, yep. Okay, so the, the super moon is because of the fact that the, dif the distance between the earth and the moon can vary by tens of thousands of miles. But the planets, they, their distance between, they, they, it varies also, but not by a degree in which it'll make them look bigger or smaller. One planet, that definitely changes in brightness and appearance the most is Mars. This is probably what led ancient folks to think of it as being the god of war, an angry, you know, uh, changeable type of planet because Mars and Earth, as we go around the sun, 
we could be very different distances. Like sometimes when we see Mars, like this year, Mars is very close to the Earth. We were so close that we launched a bunch of robots. Uh, in July, the United Arab Emirates, China, and the United States all launched robotic missions to Mars because we're so close. It's like if we were passing Mars on the inside lane of a racetrack. But next year, Mars will be on the opposite side of the sun from us. So when we do see Mars, it'll look about one eighth as bright as it did this year. So next year you'd say Mars, it looks a little red, but it looks a little pale, like a little under the weather. Mars, are you doing okay over there? And then the year after that, you'll see Mars radiant, bright, and you'll say, ooh, Mars looks angry. Mars looks fierce. And perhaps this changeable nature is what made folks think, hey, it's red. Maybe that's blood. Maybe it's bright when it's angry and it's dim when it's uh, in peace. Who knows? But the, the name of Mars comes from the Romans. The Greeks called it Aris. They associated it with their god of war. And I happen to know from the traditions of the first Vermonters, I'm talking about the people whose land we live on now, the Abenaki people. In the traditions of the Abenaki people, the planet Mars is known as Masingwa. And Masingwa is a good character, is a guardian of humanity. But in the Abenaki traditions, Masingwa wears a red mask. So he's a warrior too. So there's a lot of connections with this face changing and being maybe a warrior, maybe feisty. And that does, be, it is because of the distance between Earth and Mars changing. But the distances between all the other planets that we see don't vary as much. So the brightness doesn't change as much as it does with Mars. So I hope that explains the long answer to a short question, but let's see who <laughs> else is ready to wait for their answer. Yeah. <laughs> um. So Alex Darby from Camel's Hump Middle School would like to know, how do all the planets orbit around the sun? Ooh, this is a really cool question because when you think about the planets orbiting around the sun, not only are they close to the same line, but they're actually all going the same direction around the sun. And you might think this is weird if, if you thought they formed randomly, but actually, thanks to the fact that we have astronomy going on all over the cosmos, we know that the planets are all in this arrangement because they all formed from a ring of debris going around the sun. So the rings of Saturn, in a way, are a microcosmic lesson as to how the solar system formed. And I have a little slideshow, a picture here, based on the stuff that we've learned from the great Orion Nebula. So hold on a second, because let me just give you if you wanted to see what Earth looked like before we were a planet. Here is Orion, which is also visible tonight. If you look at the sword of Orion with a telescope, hopefully you have something like the Hubble Space Telescope, you see these little knots, these little clumps in the gas, the hydrogen gas. Here's one that's surrounded by a thick uh, veil of dust. That is what a solar system might look like before it forms. And there's more than one in the Orion Nebula. There's about a hundred of these, what we call protoplanetary disks. They're like baby stars with a little ballerina tutu around them. And if you could imagine what that would look like up close, like flying a spaceship through one, well, well, here's more of them. Here's one that I think is the one that would probably be the closest to looking like the solar system. See that bright light on the right? It's still present on the picture on the left. It's just that the dust is too thick in that version. These pictures are separated by several months. So what we see is a bright light that's being obscured by a cloud of dust that is moving around that star. Sometimes we can peekaboo see the star. Sometimes we can't. This is probably what the planets used to look like before they were planets. So imagine flying yourself through something like that. And imagine if we we're going to apply it to this picture, imagine all the stuff in this picture moving uh, counterclockwise, the stuff in the foreground moving towards the right, the stuff in the background moving towards the left. That is the way the planets go around the sun. So in that picture, you can imagine some of the debris and the rocky, heavy metal stuff closer to the sun will become Mercury, Venus and Earth and the moon and Mars. And then the stuff that gets blown out to the farther reaches, the stuff that can't sit so close to a hot star, like all the gas, that gets rolled up into planets like Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune and Uranus. And then if you're kicked way out to the edge of this disk, given the cold shoulder, so to speak, you freeze like Pluto, where you're 400 below zero and everything out by Pluto 
is frozen, but it would be very different if it had formed near the sun. So hopefully this gives you an idea of why the planets are all kind of in a line. They weren't always separate planets. They used to be all part of a giant ring of debris, similar to the ring that we see going around Saturn, but imagine a ring around the sun. So this is something that we might have speculated on, but the thing about astronomy is that with billions of stars to study, you can find examples of this happening all over the place. And just to add to an even cooler picture, recently astronomers based out of Chile using a radio telescope found a picture of a sun that was just getting its own planets. So this is a radio image. It looks blurry because they use radar instead of what we would use with our eyes. But this is a star. And look at that amazing pattern around it. It's a cloud of gas that is getting broken up into rings because the dark sections are where there are planets forming. The planet's gravity is sucking up whatever material is in their path. So this could have been a picture of the sun roughly 5 billion years ago when the Earth was just starting to form from that ring of debris. So it's like you're looking at your own baby album as a planet. So any more questions coming in? I'm so glad that folks are still tuning in. I'm amazed yeah. how many people are sticking it out. Keep coming. I am amazed and I love it. Um, so Hannah, age five from Beverly, Massachusetts would like to know why are the planets so far apart? Ah, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, it, if that's as an astronomer, that's my saddest thing. If everything was so close together, we could go visit and hang out for the afternoon and come back. But no, everything is so far. We're talking about hundreds of millions and billions of miles. We're talking about Jupiter and Saturn. So why? Well, I can't answer that. But if you were tuned in earlier, you may have heard me talk about the Trappist system, where all the planets and the sun are in that system are really close together. So it doesn't have to be this way. Maybe look at it that way. And maybe in the future, whoever is listening uh, from Beverly, Mass, if you uh, invent a spaceship, maybe you can go to a place where everybody hangs out closer together. Let me show you what that would actually look like because the Trappist system is so cool that the folks at NASA made up a travel poster for it if we were ever to go there. This is how close the planets actually are in the Trappist system, where if you were sitting on Trappist 1E, you could see one B and C and D and E. Like they would all be like a huge ball in your window. But to us, our planets are so far apart that we see them as tiny dots in the sky. But just maybe take heart in the fact that it's not that way for every planet. And maybe there are some intelligent alien kids on some other worlds where they get to see the planets, you know, have great conjunctions where they look like basketballs floating in the sky. I don't know, but it can happen somewhere. It's just not happening here. All right, the next question is from Jack Hernandez, who is nine years old, and he asks, what is Jupiter made of? Excellent question. It's mostly made out of hydrogen. And that we've known for a long time, but how that stuff is arranged on the inside of Jupiter, that was why we sent the Juno spacecraft there. And if you haven't followed along, the Juno spacecraft is currently orbiting Jupiter right now. And it has made some incredible images, but it's using not just it, cameras, but also radar and other sensors to try to peer into the clouds of Jupiter. And actually, I've got some of the images of that right here. Let me show you a little bit about what Juno looks like first. Uh, a little tribute to the fact that Juno is uh, named after Jupiter's wife, if you know your ancient mythology. And so here's a picture of the goddess Juno. And next to that picture is the actual spacecraft, Juno. It looks like a trillium flower, but notice the solar panels are huge. The solar panels are, I, if I remember correctly, about the size of a school bus, each one, the length. So why so big? Because Jupiter is so far from the sun that you need solar panels this big in order to harness the amount of energy it takes to run this satellite. And uh, I actually have some of the videos that have been made from, uh, well, here, let's, I think this will explain uh, well what's going on inside of Jupiter. They took, uh, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to arrange my video here, make sure that everybody can see this. Let's see, I hope you see a video here. 
that shows Jupiter from the outside. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit because Juno has an infrared camera and look at what it saw in the dark clouds near the North Pole of Jupiter. It's not a pizza. Those are storms. The North Pole is in the center and those other storms, eight of them that you see arranged like gears around it are all going around it. So this gives you an idea of what's going on inside of Jupiter. It is all clouds. It is all gas, it's storms. There's lightning constantly happening. So what we see is just the tops of the clouds. But Jupiter is tens of thousands of miles thick with air and clouds. And this one view from Juno gives you an idea of what's hiding under the stuff that we can see. And actually, let me show you what we see with our eyes because the other famous thing about Jupiter is its great red spot. And if you have a telescope, you'll be lucky to see that. But imagine if you were Juno, only 5,000 miles above it, you could see something like this. That's the red spot. I got to give credit to Sean Doran. He's an artist that takes the videos directly from NASA and puts creepy music to them. So you feel like you're Ripley, you know, in the alien movie hovering over this giant planet. But I'm going to fast forward through this because this is actually a series of photographs stitched together. So we're just going a little faster. And you get to see what the path that Juno takes as it goes around Jupiter and it sees these clouds. So that is hydrogen uh, and ammonia clouds. So not necessarily a pleasant recipe um, because if you know anything about ammonia, you probably know that's the smell of cat pee. So the clouds of Jupiter have the same stuff as the smell of cat urine. I hope that doesn't discourage anybody from becoming an astronaut. But here's another cool view of Jupiter. You see some other sections of it. Oh, wait, it looks like the wrong video is online. Hold on. Sorry, folks. I, I have, have to watch, have a monitor here to see if I'm putting out the right thing for everybody to see. But here, not all of Jupiter looks the same color. Here's the South Pole region. And you'll see it transitioning from the, the, the polar region to the area that we are more likely to see with our telescopes. And thanks to Sean Doran, yes, more creepy music actually from 2001 but think about this viscous storms winds are over 500 miles an hour hurricane like formations bigger than our own planet jupiter is nothing but unpleasant weather and radio radiation and magnetic fields all of which would kill you very quickly so not to discourage you from going there but now you see why we're lucky to live on this planet so any more questions coming in there? Yes. Um, Roxanne would like to know, um, she lives in Lindenville, Vermont, and would like to know what would happen if the moon exploded? Oh, oh why? Why would anybody <laughs> want to contemplate such a horrible thing? But <laughs> let me just, let me give you a hint as to how bad that would be. The thing that slammed into the earth that killed the dinosaurs is estimated to be about six miles wide. And the moon is about 2000 miles wide. So if a six mile wide rock was able to make the dinosaurs go extinct, except for the birds, just imagine if the moon hit the earth, well, you probably won't have anybody to talk about it you know, with because there will be nothing left. It would probably cause our entire planet to turn into molten lava and magma. And eventually, maybe a million years later, it would cool back down and maybe we would have oceans again. But whether the life on Earth would survive something like that is probably not likely. Why would you want to think of such a horrible thing? But yes, that would be bad. Any other questions? Hopefully nothing so cataclysmic. Haven't we had enough tragedy this year? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, Jean would like to know what type of a telescope would you recommend for an amateur? Ah, well, my strongest recommendation is to always get a telescope that you're going to use, not one that's too complicated. So if you want to get advanced and get into the robotic telescopes that have the built-in GPS and all that, you can do that and it costs a lot of money, but if it's so complicated that you can't figure out how to use it, then it's a shame and a waste. So I always start with simple telescopes. One that you can put into a backpack is ideal. 
And we even sell some at the Fairbanks Museum's nature store that would fit that mold. And you can take them with you on a camping trip or to the top of a mountain after a long hike. And then not just use them for the stars, but maybe use them to see birds and wildlife too. Get one that you're going to use. But we also, um, you know, I recommend things like the Galileo scope. This was made by the, during the International Year of Astronomy about 11 years ago, because it was commemorating the exact 400th anniversary of Galileo using a telescope. And well, actually, about a year ago, I actually got to see Galileo's real telescope, the one he used to see the moons of Jupiter. I was lucky enough to go on a trip to Florence, Italy, where they have a museum where you can see not just this bust of Galileo, but these are some of the telescopes that he made. Uh, and you can get a Galileo scope, modern times telescope made out of plastic and glass that isn't very expensive, but it gives you the same power and then double the power of what Galileo used. And it's a type of telescope that fits in a backpack and is pretty, pretty durable. So if you look at the bottom of this picture, that ivory uh, structure has a lens inside. Unfortunately, the lens is cracked, but that is the lens that Galileo used to see the moons of Jupiter. He called it the discoverer and he gave it as a gift to Cosimo de' Medici, who was one of his patrons. So those of you who like uh, the, the Florentine Renaissance will probably like to know that the Medici family were the folks who bankrolled Galileo back in those days in order to see what he saw. And if you go to Florence, not only can you see the telescopes Galileo used, but you can actually see his embalmed middle finger. Yeah, that is Galileo's middle finger. And I got to see it. And the guy in the background is a person impersonating Galileo who's doing what essentially my job is at the Fairbanks Museum, teaching kids who come on field trips about the science that they have in their museum. And I was lucky to see that in Florence. So get a Galileo scope, look those up. We have those at the Fairbanks Museum too, or get something portable. But if you wanna get something very big and fancy, you can get something like what the Poplowskis gave us made by the Mead Telescope Company, Celestron, Orion. Those are other great telescope brands that I can highly recommend. But uh, that, maybe come to visit the Fairbanks Museum and we can talk in more in depth about which telescope is right for your family. Well, I see a question coming in. Uh, yes, um, well, let's do one more question. And I'm gonna mention that if we didn't get to your questions today during our broadcast, feel free again to um, submit them to my email, kweiss at fairbanksmuseum.org and Bobby will answer them there. So I'm sorry we didn't have enough time to reach everybody. Um, I'd also like to mention that our planetarium, um, the only public planetarium in Vermont is currently closed for public presentations for safety reasons, but we can't wait to reopen it and welcome you guys back in there. And I'd also like to mention that this broadcast has reached over a thousand people and we're very eager to do it again. This was really successful and we wanna thank everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna get the last question here um, from Antonia, age seven. She wants to know why do the planets orbit the sun? Ah, well, a few minutes ago, we talked about how they formed from the debris around the sun. So maybe you could, you could also watch this video, rewind a few more minutes, but basically the planets all were once one object, a ring around the sun. And over time, gravity collapsed so that the ring became the individual planets. But even though we are all far apart and we seem very separate from each other, all of the planets go around the sun in the same direction. And it's a pretty cool thing. That's the connection that shows us that we all once originated in the same body of debris going around our sun and oh i did see a question that i was expecting this to come up and i hadn't heard it until just now i see in the chat on our zoom that somebody asked is this kind of a conjunction what could have been the star of bethlehem that people associate with christmas now i will say that we have no ancient sources that say that this conjunction was the star of bethlehem but johann kepler a famous astronomer who figured out the mathematics behind the laws of planetary motion, he calculated in the 1600s that there would have been one of these conjunctions around the year 7 BC. Hmm, that's an interesting idea that maybe that is what they refer to as what the three wise men saw in the sky. But I will say the year is off, but that's not the only reason why I don't think that that necessarily means that this was the star of Bethlehem. First of all, these three wise men 
are often uh, depicted as representing different cultures, possibly Greek, Persian, and Egyptian culture. If that's true, then they came from cultures that knew the planets very well. And they knew the planets moved. And a conjunction like this doesn't sneak up on you. You would have seen the planets Jupiter and Saturn getting closer and closer like we have this summer. And then on the night of the conjunction, it would have been very close, but you still would see two dots instead of one. So I don't know if back in those times they would have thought this was something special because they also would have known the planets very well. Remember that the story of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem takes place during the height of the Roman Empire. And we still use the Romans' names for these planets, Jupiter and Saturn. So these were well known as celestial bodies back in those times. And nobody, even down in a manger, would have been surprised to see them in the sky. That doesn't mean there wasn't something else that could explain the star of Bethlehem. There are so many other things that happen in the sky from supernovas to even comets that could also be candidates for this kind of event. So before we go, I'm just going to say one last time. If you enjoyed this event and you want to see more things like this happen, please consider becoming a member of the Fairbanks Museum. And if you tune in now during this event, you can go to our website, fairbanksmuseum.org. You can get a special $25 off discount on our membership price. And remember, these are great gifts. So those of you who are looking for a last minute Christmas gift, you still have a couple days. You can do it online and you can also visit the museum on, on Christmas Eve itself. But we're going to be closed for Christmas Day, of course. But consider us a possible last minute gift. All the same, please consider supporting museums like ours because I hope you think programming like this is a, a great thing to be able to put on even during the worst of times. We're grateful that we have a community that allows us to do things like this. So please support us and visit our website and thank you all of you for your great questions and your attendance. I'm so glad that so many people are curious about the sky. Those of you kids watching, it's not a joke when I say that you are the interplanetary generation. The kids watching this are going to be possibly walking on other planets by the time they're as old as me. So maybe this encourages you to keep that up because NASA and the world needs kids like you to keep studying this stuff. So all the same, I hope everyone out there is watching has a wonderful holiday and enjoy the solstice. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. Happy Kwanzaa. Celebrate them all and have a wonderful night. Yes, thank you everybody for tuning in. Until next time, take care and be safe and well. And again, please visit our website for any information that you need or you can email me your questions and that's also on the website. Take care everyone. Good night, thank you Karina for an excellent job. I couldn't have done this without <laughs> your help. Like uh, for Spider-Man, you're the woman in the chair <laughs> that makes this possible. So thank you and uh, everyone else have a great night.